really important um, things because this is a time when you know we're, we're trying to figure out how best to adopt a new role in school libraries, how best to switch over to becoming a curriculum and pedagogical uh, coach and consultant and, and really an expert. And one of the, the resources that we've been using uh, for many years is uh, uh, play and, and games, and especially um, board games. So we're not going to talk today about video games. We're going to be talking this afternoon about board games. Now, some of you may have very fond memories of board games like Monopoly uh, or things like that. And so, you know, we can celebrate those really fond, happy memories of family time spent around the table playing Monopoly. I too share some of those great memories because Monopoly, isn't that a wonderful game to play with friends and family? You know, you go around and you try to crush people and absolutely destroy them, drive them into financial ruin until you're the only person left in the game and everybody else has been eliminated. No fun at all. Instead, what we're using are what we would call modern board games. And modern board games are different. Uh, these come out of Germany or Europe in many cases. Um, they, they have been you know, sort of a, a revolution, a renaissance in board game development. And it actually goes back quite a few years to the um, early 70s in uh, Minnesota with 3M, Minnesota uh, Mining Company that, that we now know as 3M, when they started publishing a series of board games for adults, their bookshelf series of games. And one of the first, which is really considered sort of the, the first modern style board game, is Acquire, uh, which was designed or authored by Sid Saxon. Fun little game about finance. Now what made this game different from the many, many games, board games that have come before? Uh, games like Monopoly, Parcheesi, Sari, those, those real classic board games. What made Acquire very different is that it introduced a couple of really critical things. Uh, first and foremost, it had a much higher level of critical thinking and many more points where players had to actually make decisions. When you think about it, something like Monopoly, you roll the dice, you move your pawn, and you do what the space tells you to do. There's only one real decision in the game. Should I buy the property or not? Well, newsflash, you buy the property, okay? I hope that wasn't a spoiler alert you know, for anybody. You always buy the property. And so it's not really a decision point. You don't really do critical thinking. But in Acquire, you have to think very carefully. And what makes it so important is that you have flexible actions. And so there are many different things that you can do on your turn. You, you pick what you do. You don't roll the dice and have chance to determine your action. You decide your action. And so that's a huge, huge difference. And what that's you know, really opening us up for is the opportunity to use games to uh, instruct, to reinforce, and practice these critical thinking types of actions. Another key difference with Acquire is unlike Monopoly, which is an eliminationist style game where you play and uh, players are slowly eliminated throughout the game, Acquire and, and most other modern board games are, you know, they tend to more often be non-eliminationist. And that means everybody's in the, in, in, in the game until the end of the game where there's some sort of victory goal or, or points that are added up, victory points, things like that. And so usually there's an accounting to find a winner or winners at the end of the game, but players aren't eliminated as much during the game. And that's important for schools and libraries because you, know, you don't really want someone that's just been eliminated from Monopoly or some other game and they're angry and upset and now they're running around with nothing to do because that's a little bit of a potential problem right there. Instead, much better to go with games where everybody's in, everybody's continuing to be part of the action, everyone's continuing to make great decisions. And um, another one of the big changes is Modern board games, you can really see much more in the way of mechanisms and themes. And, and this is something that we're going to come back to and, and talk more about. But mechanisms, that's the, 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 the how the game works. And so in Acquire, um, you're involved in some stock market type of, 
uh, acquisition of companies and merging of companies. So that's a mechanism. And then the theme is you're trying to run business. And in fact, uh, in Acquire, you're trying to run originally hotel chains. Um, and so with modern board games, you can talk about, as, as you'll see when we go through this, you can talk about alignment to curriculum through both of these techniques, through mechanisms where what you're doing is part of, of learning, or through theme where kind of all, everything else that the game is about uh, is engaged and in, in aligned to the learning. And finally, uh, most importantly, um, most modern board games, or, or many of them, tend to be multi-generational. And so you'll, you'll have some that support uh, younger and older players at once, which is a really nice mix. And that's great not only for public libraries or, or libraries where we have events, but also for schools when you're talking about differentiated learning. Now as I said, library events. You'd be surprised, but actually more and more libraries are doing something with gaming. And the percentages are quite high in terms of libraries that have you know, chess boards out or you know, have some type of video games on loan. But more than three quarters of libraries are actually doing something with gaming. So it's not new. It's not really out there. But it is something that, that we need to talk more about so that we make sure that we're doing this uh, following best practice and getting the most out of the money. Again, I think board games are really a nice way to go. Because when you're doing board games, you're spending money and you're getting content. You're not spending extra money to, to put down on a console that is now completely out of date because we're never going to keep up with the console wars and that buying trend. And so I, I really think that board games can be an answer. And we've had great success with them at the school library system where I work. We've been ha uh, you know, working with board games and had a board game library now for about seven years. Huge success, a lot of adoption. So let me talk to you a little bit about why it's been so successful and what we've seen as being the most uh, promising features of this. Well, my favorite game to kick this off, the one that I really love almost the most is called Max. Uh, this is from a Canadian company, Family Pastimes. And this is a cooperative game. And what that means is everybody is sitting around the table working together on the same team against the, the game board or in this case against Max the cat. And we're trying to get our little woodland creatures in the backyard. There's a chipmunk and a mouse and a bird. We're trying to get them safely home to the big tree. But Max is the cat, and he likes to chase little animals. And you know, if a cat catches the little animal, it might not go so well for the little animal. Kids are okay with this, because you know, the circle of life and all that. They're, they're very familiar with it. Uh, but it's a great game because kids have to learn to work together. And they have to learn to engage in this very social experience. And so it's really neat to go you know, down to three years old, uh, and they can be involved in playing Max together because you know, they're not trying to compete. They're just really working together. And they do still have to make great decisions. Which animal to move when you can move two animals? When do you call Max back to the porch with a treat so he doesn't grab an animal? What are we going to do each turn? And there are other types of social experiences that we can use in schools and libraries to move this forward. And again, here's where board games can really shine. Because when you're playing a board game, you're sitting around a table with people, looking at people, interacting with people. And it is a very social experience. Whether you're, you're in a public library or a classroom or a school library, there are great opportunities to really truly have social growth experiences. So we're going to look at uh, five games that, that talk about that. You know, Max is a great example of a cooperative game. And there are many more cooperative games coming on the market right now that uh, really, really meet that sort of group teamwork in a, a very real and um, a very nice way. They're very satisfying to play. We're also going to talk about some party games and trivia games and drawing games and social games. And what's really nice is you're going to see that there's often a little twist. In, in some of these games. So another example of a social experience is a party game like Dixit, uh, Dixit Odyssey. There are a couple different versions. I love this one because it goes up to 12 players per game box. And so you've got a lot of return on a, on a small amount of investment. And the way Dixit works is you've got these crazy, crazy cards there like dolly paintings. I mean, really wild out there kinds of things. And you're trying to engage with the other players uh, in a, a social transaction. 
and so you're going to pick a card and you're going to say something about the card, you know, some phrase, some set of words that you hope other people will, will clue in on. Um, so it's kind of like yeah, apples to apples where you want some people to figure out which card you picked, uh, but not everybody. And, and then all the other players are going to put out cards that they think might match that. And so it's a really neat way to start talking about social transactions and making connections with people. And you have to do a lot of critical thinking as well. I love Wits and Wagers. Uh, this is by North Star Games. And this is actually their family edition. Uh, the regular edition of Wits and Wagers is, is nice. It's a little more complicated. And it also involves a betting mechanism, a wagering mechanism. And they chose to make the board green felt. Now some places green felt works okay. You know, coming up at American Library Association meeting in Las Vegas, there'll be quite a bit of green felt in gambling. But in school libraries, green felt is kind of a, a problem. And so we were really happy that North Star Games made a family edition that took out the green felt and just put in those big little figures that you see there, what are often called meeples. Um, and they put those in to, to work instead. Now Wits and Wagers, as I said, there's a little twist on it. And so this is a trivia game, but there's a twist. And modern board games have these wonderful little twists that make them special. And the twist in Wits and Wagers is you don't have to know the answer. It's okay if you don't know the answer to the trivia question that's being asked. You just have to think, I wonder which player might know the answer. So now we're going to try something that I've never done before, and I'm not actually sure that anybody has done this before. This might be a world first, as we're going to try and play a board game via conference call and chat. So I'm taking the first four answers that pop up in chat. How many miles of bookshelves are there in the Library of Congress? So if you think you have an answer, we have, all right. Jenny put in 5,210, a million, a million miles. One million and 10,000. Well, we'll put 10K. All right. Uh, 5,210, 1,010K. Now, like uh, so many kind of games, uh, the, the goal here is to be the closest without going over on the number of miles of bookshelves in the Library of Congress. Closest without going over. So everybody, make your picks. 5,210, 1,010K. And the answer is 838. And so the correct answer is yellow 210. Beth, if I had a prize that I could give you over this conference call, I would send it your way. But instead, you just get a uh, silent cheer from, from the crowds. But the, clue is, or the, the key is everybody else who picked 210 as the answer would also score points. So you score a point for writing the correct answer, but everybody also can score points for putting their marker, the marker of their color, on what they think the right answer is. And so like I said, the twist is you don't have to know the answer, but you have to look at these answers and you have to say, hmm, which of these sounds right? And so it's a great way to really start talking to kids about estimation. And, and thinking about answers. And you know, that, that kind of thing where the calculator tells you an answer, then you, you just write it down blindly because it's a calculator and it's always right, always right. And if you don't ever stop to think and say, wait a second, there's no way that could be the answer. I must have hit a key wrong. That, that hit me, I, I remember, a lot of times in math. So great little game for teaching that. We also can do you know, little um, tricks and, and maneuvers in drawing games. And so there's an example of a great drawing game called Telestrations, which works beautifully. Again, it goes up to 12 players. And so we, we've got a lot of people engaged around the table. You know, Wits and Wagers um, goes up to 10 players for Wits and Wagers family. But my goodness, I, I just did it a couple weeks ago with 30 students in a class, and we broke them into six teams. And so it certainly works beautifully as a team game you know, to, to break it up and, and do it. It's, it's a lot of fun. 
Telestrations is this great mixture of telephone and, and illustrating. And so you're, you're writing a word, and the next player draws the picture, and the next player guesses the word, and the next player draws the picture. And it passes around the table you know, with 8, 9, 10 players. And when it comes back, who knows what it's going to show up there because of, you know, it's gone through 7, 8, 9 iterations of uh, writing the word, guessing off the picture, and then drawing the picture from the word that was written down. I think the box does include some mechanism for scoring this, but we've never been able to stop laughing at the end of Telestrations long enough to care enough who might have won. And so that's kind of a great way to talk about a social experience. Now you can have slightly more serious experiences, like for example with the game The Resistance. Um, and this is a neat little game that works very nicely for teens, because it brings in this whole uh, aspect of uh, secretive and um, traitors and figuring out who's part of the team and who's a traitor. You know, it, it's really neat. It's kind of, you know, brings in that Hunger Games kind of thing and uh, Battlestar Galactica and, you know, which is a, a wonderful board game, but it takes a couple hours. And here's the resistance that takes, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. And so it's a lot shorter. Uh, you know, it's that aspect of werewolf, but you don't have to have everybody talking in large groups. And so there's a lot of great ways that we can do this to create more social experiences. And those social experiences are really key. And Dr. Scott Nicholson, uh, who is at the iSchool at Syracuse and does a lot of research on gaming and gamification in libraries, you know, said this beautifully, that libraries you know, with gaming can engage people of different ages and backgrounds who may never meet in social settings elsewhere. And I think this is definitely true in school libraries as well. And you know, my colleague and I, we've seen great examples of pulling out cooperative games. And all of a sudden, uh, students that wouldn't otherwise interact, students from different cliques, the jocks and smart kids, and you know, all those cliques that they, you know exist in the schools. But when they have to come together to beat the game, they, they, they work together. They talk. They interact. And they have to because the games we're talking about are so in incredibly engaging, so engaging that they really want to be part of the game. But to be part of the game, you have to interact socially. And this is you know, becoming a lost skill in this time of everybody looking down at their smartphones and everybody engaging more online than in person. And so we really think you know, board games are, are a way to bring that back. Plus, they're a heck of a lot of fun. And so they're a natural fit, as, as Dr. Nicholson says, a natural fit for libraries. So where could you start? Uh, well, Dr. Nicholson recommends a great game called Blockus. And the, the video is not going to play, um, but you can look up a, a video review that he has of Blockus. And uh, what I really love about it is he'll, he'll talk about Blockus, uh, which is a game you, know, you can find at Target or, or anything like that. Uh, just a fun little geometric shape game. Uh, it's a great game for, for libraries to bring out because it's what uh, Scott then, you know, kind of calls a bait game, like, like chum in the water. Um, and Blockus is really easy because it's got these, these pretty pieces and a board. And really, there's only a couple of rules. Um, each turn, you put a piece down. You have to start down in the corner. Uh, closest to you, touching the corner. And after that, you can only ever have your color pieces touch on corners. So you can kind of see an example in the, in the picture where the green pieces only ever touch other green pieces on corners, and they can never touch on a flat side. So three rules, 30 seconds, bam, people are off playing the game and having a lot of fun. But what I love and what Scott shows in the video is you can buy Blockus and then you can buy Giant Blockus. And Giant Blockus is Blockus like twice, three times as large. It's quite large. You know, huge plastic pieces um, that, that hold it in the hands. It's beautiful and wonderful, Giant Blockus. And that's the kind of library gaming experience that libraries and schools can excel at. If we try to do, you know, like with video games, we're never going to have the latest game, and we're never probably going to have the games they really want, because we're probably not going to have you know, the, the very violent first-person shooter games in, in our schools. 
but we can still do a game experience. And so it's the difference between the game and the game experience. And Blockus brings in this really cool game experience. And so you know, there's just another example of where somebody did a homemade Blockus um, you know, cutting out on cardboard and putting it in a, a huge grid. And so a lot of fun, but really that idea that we can bring in a game experience that is absolutely unique and that schools and libraries can really excel at that. We can also start to look at uh, other types of library gaming. You know, bulletin board things, things that are almost familiar, but extending them a little bit, bringing in more family and in a community focus. For example, Fauna. Um, this is a fun little game that actually uh, came out in you know, Germany first, as so many of the games do. Uh, it was kind of funny because it came out in metric, and, and so we, got, we actually imported it from, from a German store and, and had it in metric. And, and so we're sitting around number one trying to translate all the cards into English. Um, and number two, trying to figure out the metric system, which is a lot more difficult um, if, if we're not really uh, thinking about metric every day. But this got you thinking about, well, how many meters would a tiger be in length? And how long would a tiger's tail be? And how much would a tiger weigh in kilograms versus pounds? And I love this game because, again, you don't have to be right on. You just have to think about it. Well, here's a game also that you could put up on a bulletin board in your library. It's just a map. You know, you could. Uh, blow the map up or, or figure out some way to just prop it up on an easel. And you could have students on, on little sheets of paper or something make their guesses on a daily basis about uh, tiger or whatever animal that you put up there. And so uh, basically the way it works is you're trying to guess certain aspects of each animal, how much they weigh, how long they are, how long their tail is, and then where they live in the world. And you get points for being correct or uh, one sort of step off from correct as well. And so it's just a, a nice way again to do that kind of different type of experience that can become uh, very social. Another great example of that is Quiddler. If you can play Gen Rummy, uh, you can play Quiddler. It's just Gen Rummy with uh, letters on cards instead of suits and numbers. And so you're picking cards up and you're putting cards down and you're trying to build words. And uh, what I really like about Quiddler um, you remember if I talked about some of the distinctive nature of, of modern board games at the beginning, Quiddler builds in some multi-generational uh, differentiation type techniques in that you score bonus points for the longest word with the most letters in it. You get 10 bonus points each round, but you also get the same number of bonus points, 10 bonus points for having the most very small words. And so students or, or children that are thinking up uh, very small words, two or three letter words, can score bonus points as well as someone who comes up with a seven, eight letter word, uh, which is really nice. So if you're ready here, we're going to do another little uh, game over the, over the webinar thing. Uh, here are some cards from Quiddler. Uh, set games, if you're familiar with one of their other games, uh, set. So we'll, we'll look in the chat window for uh, some words that people come up with. You have to use all six letters. And there we have Ginny found Ravine, which is the six letter one. Yep, Elizabeth, yep. But there are other ones in there, and there are other ways to do. Um, so Naomi found Vane, but now you've got to use the other words, or the other letters. I'm going to see if R or Ra, Rain and uh, I don't know if V is one, VE. Of course, it's always fun to play Quiddler with the um, Oxford English Dictionary because, my goodness, you can put basically any two or three letters together and you've got something going on there. Vi and Ran, great catch there, yep. Uh, rave and In works. And so you can see lots of different ways to do this. Now, Quiddler puts up. Um, Every day they have a Quiddler Puzzle of the Day up on their website. And so you can go up there and check it out. And they certainly have different ways to use this in the classroom. They encourage using this in schools and libraries. You know what are nice things if you've got a message board or something up in the library? Uh, you could just get the game and, and put the cards out you know, behind uh, um, you know, or stick them up on a little thing or in a, a word you know, sentence chart or something if you borrow that from an elementary place. Uh, you've got a way to go in and 
and and do this and just put these out on a daily basis and and just you know have it for students there to explore and and figure stuff out that whole idea of making the library a destination and a gaming experience you know it's a great study hall game as well there's you know, like Blockus or something, very few rules. It's just, okay, you're going to play it like Gin Rummy. You know, you draw a card. When you have words, you have to use all the cards in your hand, play the last card face down on the pile in the middle, and lay out all your words. Um, and, and it works beautifully. And my goodness, yeah, they're playing a game, but they're using their brains, and they're thinking through vocabulary. And there's a heck of a lot more going on than some stupid little Facebook flash game where they're just exercising their pointer finger as they you know, mindlessly click on the mouse. This is gaming and, and you know, interaction at an entirely different level where the brain is going, they're feeling like they're getting a rest, but endorphins are still kicking off. And um, it's still wor Vayner. I had never even thought about Vayner. That, that's a great one. You know, you look at these and you just keep coming up with more and more words and things. So it's a lot of fun. Speaking of kind of like fun games that work great for family, um, a lot of modern board games have, have tricky little things in there that combine strategy and chance. Now these are kind of the, the two opposite ends of the spectrum or the continuum, strategy and chance. Now some, some call it luck, but I, I, I like to call it chance um, so that we, we don't have that, well, I'm lucky, I'm not lucky. You know, no, it's, it's completely randomly chance at, at the far end. And so you can sort of map any game out on this continuum and where it lies, you know, where it falls between strategy and chance. Uh, chess, for example, 100% strategy. There is absolutely no chance to it. It's 100% strategy. And in fact, there are entire books written on you know, every possible game in chess. And so there's considered like you know, you're, you're playing through this game that's already happened before, and all the moves are mapped out. Um, you know, actually interesting in chess, when, when you go off book, you know, and, and you, you actually come up with something new, a game of chess that's never been played before. Um, on the other end, you have a game like War where you just shuffle the cards, you deal out cards to two players, you flip up cards, and whoever has the higher number wins. I mean, that's complete chance. There, there's absolutely no strategy that you can, oh, I'm going to flip it slowly. Like, that's going to matter. What I'm going to think really hard. It's not going to change the, the top card. I mean, you're either going to flip it up, and you're either going to have a higher number or a lower number, and, and that's just all there is to it. But then you start getting into some modern board games that have strategy but often use the element of chance as a way to help um, make the game work better with players that aren't familiar with the game or with younger players. And so really when you're talking to people about games to play, when somebody comes up to you and says, what should I play today? You almost have to do gamer advisory like we might do reader's advisory. Because for certain groups, games may or may not work. You know, if you give a group of players a pure strategy game and there's one person that, that's not as quick on strategy, they're going to struggle. Or if you have three players that have all played this strategy game and a new player, it's not going to go well for them necessarily because there are established strategical things they might miss. But then you have Spooky Stairs, Geister Trip. Now this was a uh, Kinderspiel der Jahre winner, Jahres winner, which is a German award like we have, American Library Association does, Newberries and Caldecotts. Uh, the, the Spiel um, Fair, Spieltag in Essen, Germany every year gives out now the uh, Spiel Jahres Game of the Year, sort of Family Game of the Year, and Kinderspiel for the Children's Game of the Year. And now they also give um, like a Gamer Game of the Year, that's a little more of a strategy Game of the Year. But Spooky Stairs is a great little game. You can see that green pawn in the background. And everybody, four players, each have a color pawn. And you have a little uh, token marker in front of you, a little wooden token in front of you. So you remember what color you are, which is going to become a lot more important than you would think. Because as you play the game and you roll the die, a little ghost will come up on the die. And when a ghost comes up, you start covering the pawns with those white ghosts that you see. Now, you do remember what color you were and which pawn is yours under those identical white ghosts. Yes, I hope so, because when the ghosts keep coming up after all the pawns have been covered, all of a sudden you get to start swapping ghosts. And your pawn isn't where you thought it was. 
And if that's not crazy enough, you can play the advanced variant when the ghost comes up and all the pawns are covered, and you can start swapping tokens. So you're no longer the green player, now you're the red player. And you remember where the red one was, because you were keeping track of your green one, but you didn't think you had to keep track of the red player. And oh my goodness, was the yellow one up top about to win or not? And more often than not, you'll get to the top, and one of the ghosts will get to the top of the stairs and win, and you have to check under there to see which one it is and who won. Because you might have... Uh, accidentally caused another player to win thinking that it was you. And so it's a great game because, you know, let, let's be honest, um, I can't keep track of all of this. And so I'm on the same footing as, as a four or five year old who's working through this. They might uh, be able to follow better than I can sometimes. So it's a fun game and, and really, you know, still a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, trying to keep track of stuff, not just a simple memory game, but, but a lot of really deep, uh, deep things going on. Finally, I think libraries, especially like public libraries, can reach out to the community. Uh, with a game like Flashpoint, which is a new game that came out recently, it's a cooperative game where you're fighting fires. And so you're going through and you have these little, little fire people, and they, uh, the whole rule set developed to go into a building and put out fires and rescue Kitty and people and everybody else. And it's a really neat game because, you know, you can engage with the community. I, I live in a rural area of New York, and it's all volunteer fire companies around here. And so, you know, neighbors are involved in the volunteer fire company. And, and it's, it's part of a, you know, small town community certainly here. And so what a great way to, to engage with the community and to bring people in and have games that are about, you know, your area. Uh, so just a, a really neat thing to do. So we're going to move now to talking a little bit about games in schools and curriculum. And I, I love this quote from, from David Lubar in his, uh, his book, Wizards of the Game. You know, people didn't realize how great games are for preparing you for life. You can make a mistake, nobody gets hurt, you can keep going on. And, you know, true, if people were smart, they'd pass the will to have games in every school. Every school and every school library. And that's kind of my goal and, and what I'm working for. Um, and, and really excited to be able to do it because I want to bring games like Strain into every class that's talking about cellular biology and cells. And this is a, you know, just, it's a wonderfully fun game to play, but it's also incredibly aligned to the curriculum. So you have an organism in the middle, and, and you're building onto it with organelles, and you've got your uh, cytosols and cytoplasm. And uh, notice you've got some cards there in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the front of the picture including your autophagocytosis, uh, which you can look up on Wikipedia, and it's uh, something. So now you've got this great curriculum-based game that's got cards in it that are actual terms in cellular biology. And so what a great way to say, okay, let's take these cards and pass them out, and here's your research assignment. Is this card accurate? Does this card do what you would expect it to do in the game based on what it actually is in real biology? And you can you know, really um, bring that in and bring the game in as a way to learn or reinforce that academic vocabulary that's so important as part of the Common Core to bring in that, that close reading of the game, to say, why did they pick this card to do that? Why did they name it that? Uh, why do they have this rule in the game? Uh, so think about you know, close reading of a board game as, as we might close read anything else. Uh, so just really exciting possibilities. So we've developed here in, in, in the school library system uh, with our game library, we've developed four um, really important rules for purchasing games and looking at games. First, it has to be a real game. And Strain is a real game. It's gone through like three printings now. It's popular. People play Strain. Um, yes, it's a curriculum aligned game, and it's very much aligned to cellular, the cellular process in biology, and we can do that. But first, it's a real game. It's not what you might call an educational game. You know those where you flick the spinner, and then you do the worksheet it lands on. It doesn't work. Kids see right through that because our kids are gamers. Like every single one of them pretty much. They play games every day just about. They will see right through it if we try to give them some you know, worksheet disguised with a spinner or rolling some dice. We have to have real games that are really engaging and that deal with real content and real fun in play. 
and then we can align them to the standards. Then we can see what's going on with them. So another example here is Numbers League designed by Chris Pallas, who's actually uh, here near me in, in Rochester, New York. And Numbers League is a really neat game. You know, it's a fun game to play, um, but it's, it's very much a, a math game. And so you end up doing a lot of math with this game while you have fun playing it. And so we, we, we use this one a lot, and it goes out quite a bit. Uh, teachers love it. I had a third grade teacher, uh, went down and worked with her with this game, and, and, she, and she called me the next day, and she was almost crying. I said, what, what's, what's going on? And she, she said, I'm, my kids, they, in the afternoon we had free time, and they came back to me and they said, can, can, we, can we play some more math, please? Uh, the, the, the kids, the students were so engaged with this game that they wanted to go back and explore it more. And you're going to see here, it, it is definitely a math game. Uh, so in this game, you have your superheroes. So on the left here, we have a superhero uh, made up by a head, a body, and legs that are different cards. These all happen to match, but normally they get all crazy, mixed up, and funny and silly. Um, now this superhero on the left uh, is made up of three, three, three. So this is a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's a nine. The middle one is negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, so it's a negative 3. And a negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, so it's a negative 6. So 9, negative 3, negative 6. And then we have some modifier weapons and, and tools up at the top. We have jetpacks that give plus 5 to a total for a superhero. We have a laser axe that is times negative 1. And I hope you're remembering your math that when you times a negative number by a negative number, something weird happens. So we can use as many or as few superheroes as we need. We can put one tool per superhero only. So if we put the laser axe on somebody, only can go on one superhero, and each superhero only gets one tool. And we're trying to capture by hitting exactly on the number 17. So is there a way to combine these superheroes and tools to reach exactly the number 17. So let's see if anybody comes up with an answer in the chat window. We've got 3, 6, 9. What could we come up? Let's see. We could start with the 9 maybe, right? And if we started with the 9, we could then, well, what if we turn the negative 6 times negative 1, which turns it into positive 6, which gives us 15. We're close. We're close. How do we get to 17 if we're at 15? Um... What if we added the plus 5 jetpack to the negative 3 superhero in the middle, which takes us from negative 3 plus 5 is 2. So we've got 9 plus now 2 plus now a positive 6. And all of a sudden, we are at 17. And there are multiple ways to do this. Uh, you can play around with different uh, possibilities and different explorations. But what a great way to really explore and play with math. And you know, Common Core Math, which we definitely need to know about in the libraries, Common Core Math is about playing with math and really understanding in that deep, deep level of engagement how numbers work and interact and how you can take multiple paths to get to number 17. Now in the game, there are you know, 20 different villains out there for you to consider capturing at once. And so it's a great deal of fun. And the other thing that the third grade teacher reported back to me was, she said she noticed that the, um, the students were all giving names to the villains. The superheroes kind of have, you know, if you can sort of see in there, this is Transparent Teen Idol and Phantasmal Photon Phantom. But the villains didn't have names, and so they were naming the villains. And so she handed villain cards out and said, uh, here's your writing prompt for the day. Tell me you know, your villain's name and, and what happened to them that turned them to a life of crime. And so all of a sudden, this math game became this really cool writing prompt as well. 
and so definitely aligned to, to math standards and then aligned as well by the teacher to writing and writing prompts. But we always are talking about a return on investment in the games because we know that you know, classroom time, it's, it's tough to get in there. You have 40 minute periods. Are you going to be able to teach this and do this in a 40 minute? Is it worth taking multiple uh, periods or multiple days of class to go through and use a game as part of instruction? And really the question is, what's the return on the investment? Numbers League does not have a huge investment in terms of learning the rules, and you certainly get a lot back of using math in the game. Another example of this is uh, Timeline, which is just a, a short, little, fun game, you know, great study hall game, but also just a great game to, to do to start thinking about history. You know, it's not so much the memorization of when things happen in history, but I, I feel you know, what's really important for students is to be able to put things in order throughout history. To be able to say, yes, I understand that the ancient Greek civilization came before the ancient Roman civilization. And that's important because the Romans built on a lot of stuff that the Greeks knew, including their entire um, you know, pantheon of gods, basically, that they lifted wholesale and changed the names on. And so those are important kind of things to know in history. Well, Timeline looks at this, and, and as you can sort of see in the picture, cards, and um, there's the front side of the card, which you have in front of you, um, and then there's the back side of the card that has the actual date on it, when that happened. And so basically what you're doing is, is you know, it'll start out with one card in the middle, and you've got to put your card that you picked to use out of your five cards that you're trying to get rid of. Am I going to put the first Viking raid before or after the first train accident? And it doesn't matter you know, when the first Viking raid was, but you really should know that Viking raids came before trains. And so now there are two cards. And so then the next thing goes in. Well, was Louis the Fourteenth crown king of France before or after the first train accident and before or after the first Viking raids. And so when you start going through, it starts getting a lot more difficult and you really have to start thinking. Um, fun game, a lot of fun. And I've got to say, you know, not a lot of penalty for being wrong. You just have to draw a new card out off the, the deck and you can kind of see what it is because the top's always showing. So you might even just kind of, oh, I don't care if I get this right or wrong, that card I think I know, so I don't mind drawing a card. And what I've really found when we play this is um, the, the people around the table start like helping each other because they really, you know, it's, it's kind of that open game where everybody sees what people's cards are and you start talking through it. And it's one of those where you don't really care who wins and loses, but, but the doing it and the having fun is, is a great experience. And, and then we really talk about, you know, fitting into the classroom and being a part of what's going on in the classroom. Um, and so, one of the, the last games I want to talk about here is Robo Rally, which I love because right now we really should be talking more and more about STEM in the library. We should be talking about STEM in terms of our uh, collection development practices, in, in our nonfiction collections. We really need to be making sure that we're, we're purchasing you know, books that are dealing with more uh, literary nonfiction, the narrative form of, of nonfiction and information books. And we need to also be focusing on technology and math uh, as well. And so here's a great way to focus on some technology and engineering with a little robot programming game where you have to move robots around a board and avoid the uh, turning uh, pieces in the factory and, and there are conveyor belts and lasers and all kinds of other things. But it's a way for us to really focus on what's kind of a big topic right now that we really should be involved in because, you know, the White House has their Office of STEM Education and you can't do anything without hearing about STEM. And so, of course, libraries should be leading in, in this type of learning as well. Yeah. And the other great place that I think libraries can really uh, excel and be part of this is special needs. And, and addressing uh, students with special needs. Because many of these games that I've shown you, if you sort of think back to them and look back, are language independent. And you know, you don't have to be able to read and write. And, and you don't have to be able to read and write in English to be able to use these games. And so my colleague Brian Mayer and I, uh, go out and work with, with students with special needs in classes. He goes out and, and does gaming events usually once a month or so with some middle school and high school classes. I go out every month and, and have 
a, a gaming class with a kindergarten class of students with special needs. And we also you know, have been able to, to really promote games in our region of um, migrant workers, uh, children, and so we have a lot of English language learners. So often in our schools, anything that's seen as you know, gifted and talented or you know, enrichment, it's all based around reading and writing. And, and these games focus on critical thinking without that language dependence. For example, here's a game called Monza from a company uh, known as Haba. And Haba is uh, a German company and beautiful, incredible, amazing baby toys, but also wonderful board games. And in Monza, you're rolling a whole bunch of dice and using the colors that come up to move your car around the racetrack by going from color to color. Now you do have to do some critical thinking and decision making because the order in which you use your colors will determine, you know, maybe you can go a little bit farther if you, if you jump uh, in, in a certain order and save a die, a purple die, for a, for a later space that you might come to. And so we love being able to give these students um, true critical thinking experiences where they are thinking and making decisions and, and really working out and solving problems, but at a, an appropriate level and, and, and in a language independent way. So that maybe if they're struggling with language, that's not going to hold them back. We can still have them really exceed and we can still assess their progress and assess their understanding in this language independent way. So if you're excited about what you heard, and if you want to get more information, where do you go? Um, well, Brian and I wrote a book called Libraries Got Game, published ALA Editions 2010. Um, so in terms of the games mentioned, a lot of them are still in print, but some of them now unfortunately are, are out of print. Uh, but there's a lot of great stuff in there. We're hoping to come out with some more information soon. Uh, Scott Nicholson's book, Everyone Plays at the Library, uh, definitely goes out a little bit more into public libraries and talking about gaming experiences there. You can see sort of the latest of what we're up to on our game website at gvlibraries.org uh, where we have all the games in our collection. We have a few hundred games uh, in our collection that are cataloged. We have others that um, are in our collection but more as an archive because I'm pretty sure we are the largest library archive holding um, in a public you know, sector sense of board games in the country. And so we've been trying to do an archival collection of the Spiel des Jahres and Kinder Spiel des Jahres, and hopefully now maybe working out with the uh, Strong National Museum of Play to co-host these archives uh, of games. But you can see all of our games there. We've got the number of players, time it takes, uh, grade level. Uh, we talk a little bit about you know, what they're aligned to, things there. Um, uh, BoardGameGeek.com is really the reference place. This is you know, the, the reference book online for, for everything and just about every board game ever created. It is actually you know, really a, an amazing thing when we come across a, a game that's not in here, even you know, very old, small. You know, somebody published a game, a lot of them are still listed on BoardGameGeek. And I know it was promised a little bit earlier. Um, unfortunately, we do not have, as I was hoping we would have, uh, we, we made some changes that are going to be even better as they come out soon. But I'm working on a new site called PlayPlayLearn.com uh, that hopefully will be up in the next couple of months. It, uh, we were talking about maybe just starting out as a newsletter, and now it's going to be a whole site where you can go and uh, access you know, all kinds of additional resources that go along with gaming. So. You know, stay tuned. You can go there now and fill out, uh, email me, or, or uh, fill out a form for more information and to get notified when we launch. But we're really hoping to go through and, and be able to have a, a deeper conversation, um, introducing education to the gaming world and introducing the, the board game world to education, to really talk about uh, possibilities to, to move forward. Um, there are some grants available. Uh, I know there's a there's a great store. Um, online board game store called Fun Again, funagain.com. Uh, there's a store up in the Pacific Northwest, and they do some you know small grants for starting a collection um, for schools and libraries. So really nice stuff there. You know, 
PTAs, you know, or whatever you have at your school, uh, you know, great place to go and, and try and get started. You know, it might be worth going and talking to a local game store. That local game stores tend to be run by people who love games and are always very happy to share gaming information out. Um, they often have sort of open box demo games so they can help you learn the games, or they might be willing to come into the library or the school and show off some games to help you get started and think about things there. And I know we have now a little bit more time. If there are any other questions in the chat, or if there were any questions that came across on Twitter. Uh, hi, Christopher. I don't think we have any questions on uh, Twitter. We did have some great commentary going on. So um, I encourage you all to take a quick look at hashtag EasyBib events if you want to see what um, EasyBib was tweeting. Um, or uh, or uh, Naomi Bates was also tweeting uh, using that hashtag. So uh, again, if you want to check out some of the comments, um, you can use that hashtag um, EasyBibEvents. Uh, and if any of you have any follow-up questions for Christopher, you can feel free to email me and I will get those along to him. Uh, we will be sending out uh, the recording of the webinar as well as the slide deck. So we'll be getting that to you as well. And I'm putting my email address in the chat box right here. Uh, so Christopher, thank you so much. This was a really great webinar. I'm a big fan of board games, so it was kind of fun to see this um, as well. Um, I've played one actually that was quite similar to Strain. I think it was called Pandemic, which is kind of the yes. same thing. You're, you're, you're playing together as a team against the board, which is pretty fun. So. Uh, anyway, thank you so much again, Christopher, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, I hope that you all are getting a little more sun as well. We're getting a little sun and a little warmer weather here in New York City, which has been great. So um, best wishes to everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. And, and do please feel free to email me as well, chris at playplaylearn.com. Okay, great. Thanks so much.